So perhaps, before dismissing his philosophy as the climatic point of subjectivist madness, we should give Fichte a chance. To properly understand his passage to full idealism, it is necessary to bear in mind how he radicalizes the primacy of practical reason, which had already been asserted by Kant. We have seen thus far the theory of Lacan about subjectivity. In it, Lacan explains how the subject becomes a desiring subject due to his self-consciousness which, in turn, is derived from the starting point of the mirror stage, as is formative of the eye. From this starting point, the rest of Lacan's theory follows. Lacan does, however, not explain what the subject needs in the first place to become self-conscious. In other words, Lacan does not explain what we need to make the a priori judgment that the picture in the mirror is not us. That is where we had to divert to Kant. Kant showed how these synthetic a priori judgments are possible, and how this leads to reason. He showed that there is nothing in the object that tells us how to judge the object, and therefore the judgment has to be synthetic a priori, that is, belong to the subject. So when we look in the mirror and we make the judgment that the picture in the mirror is me, we can say that there is nothing in the specular image itself that tells us that the object is different from the subject. It is only inferred by our conscious activity. But then, what do we need to go from the manifold of representations in the mirror to this oneness in consciousness? Well, as we have seen in the critique of Kant, the answer is synthesis. That is, rule-governed activity. What then are these rules? The answer, the categories of the understanding. And we need these categories to make the synthetic a priori judgments. However, Kant never gave us the derivation of these categories. They were just given. Furthermore, Kant notes that the categories belong to the phenomenal realm and never to the noumenal, that is, to things in themselves. However, Kant then goes to say that the noumenal realm is the cause of our experiences. So, how can that be if the categories do not apply to things in themselves? In summary, we have the end point of the formation of the subject, that is, self-consciousness, and the consequent theory of Lacan. And we have the predicate of this theory where Kant explains how we got there using his transcendental idealism. However, the starting point is still missing. This is exactly where Johann Gottlieb Fichte starts his science of knowledge. Fichte aimed to make a science from philosophy. That is, he tried to find the one principle that has no further underlying principles, yet can explain all following ones. Fichte thus had to show how he can get to self-consciousness without invoking things in themselves, while also deducting the categories of the understanding. So, how does Fichte go about doing this? Well, Fichte starts with the derivation of the three principles on which his science is based. It is these three principles, his Grundlage, which are the underlying principle for his science. So, let us start with the first principle. In his lecture, Fichte starts with the proposition A equals A, a proposition which is accepted by everyone and that without a moment's thought. It is admitted to be perfectly certain and established. Yet, this proposition says nothing about the existence or reality of A. It does not say that A exists. On the contrary, the proposition fully abstracts from existence. Even if A in itself would be an impossibility, then the proposition A equals A would still remain. The trueness of A equals A does not rely on the reality of A. That is, it is transcendental. Or, in the words of Foster, the certainty thus lies not in A itself, but in the act of thinking. If A is thought, then it is true that A equals A. What is decisive is the connection between the two sides. 
There is one condition, however, for which this is true. And that is that both A's need to be in the consciousness of the same subject to be true. In the words of Kant, the I think must be able to accompany all my representations. In other words, the statement A equals A presupposes a subject, an I, for which the relation of A with itself is true. When we say A equal A, we are not affirming the identity of a thing with itself, we are also making a statement about the self-consciousness of the I. Fichte argues that the I is the subject who asserts the truth of the equation A equals A. Thus, the affirmation of the identity of A with itself involves an implicit affirmation of the identity of the self with itself. That is, you cannot make the affirmation of A equals A without also affirming the truth of I am I, since the I is the subject who recognizes and affirms the truth of both equations. Hence, the first principle of Fichte's science of knowledge, his ground, is the proposition I am I. It is the I that posits itself, or, according to Fichte, the I originally and absolutely posits its own existence. That is to say, the thinking of the I and the thought I itself, the activity that produces and that which is produced, deed and action, are one and the same. Or, according to Stephens, the I recognizes itself as produced by itself. The thinking I and the thought I, cognition and the object of cognition, are one. And all cognition begins with this point of unity, not with the scattered reflection that has time and space and the categories given passively to it. It is this necessary first step that Fichte calls Taathandlung, deed, action. Fichte starts with the thetic judgment, I am I, pure imminence of life, pure becoming, pure self-positing, taat handlung. The full coincidence of posited with positing. I am only through the process of positing myself, and I am nothing but this process, this intellectual intuition, this mystical flow inaccessible to consciousness. It is the Lacanian subject which states, I think where I am not, therefore I am where I do not think. This first principle of the I positing its own existence is known as the category of reality, since it is by this taathandlung that we affirm the reality of any A or A equal A. However, by this fact alone, the I positing itself, we cannot yet explain empirical consciousness. For empirical consciousness does not only entail identity, but also negation. Therefore, Fichte again starts with a proposition which everyone holds as certain, and that is, minus A does not equal A. Again, we can see that the truth of this statement is not located in the content of A. The certainty only relates exclusively to the form of the proposition. If anything at all is posited in opposition to an A, then it is not identical to A. This principle cannot, however, be derived from the first principle, for position as such contains no negation. Now, even though this second principle cannot be derived from the first, it is conditioned by the first as there can be no negation without the A itself already being posited. Since this again is located in the I, and since there is nothing initially but the self-positing of the I, there can only be a negation opposed to this absolute I. This is what Fichte calls the non-I. And as surely as the absolute certainty of the proposition minus A does not equal A, is unconditionally admitted among the facts of empirical consciousness, just as surely is a non-I opposed absolutely to the I. This second principle is also known as the category of negation, 
which is thus also derived from the original Taathandlung. We now, however, run into a logical problem, a contradiction. By the original Taathandlung, the I simultaneously posits both an I and a non-I. But if the derivation so far is correct, then if the two principles are in the same consciousness, they would cancel each other out, for minus 1 plus 1 equals 0. Yet, the observation that we have self-consciousness is proof that this is not the case. Thus, the question is, how can A and minus A, being and non-being, reality and negation, be thought together without mutual elimination and destruction? The answer, they can only exist if they mutually limit each other. That is, if they are both divisible. Only now, in virtue of the concept of divisibility thus established, can it be said of both to be something. The absolute I of the first principle is not something. It has and can have no predicate. It is simply what it is. And this can be explained no further. But now, by means of this concept, consciousness contains the whole of reality, and to the non-I is allotted the part of it which does not attach to the I, and vice versa. Consciousness is one, but in this consciousness the absolute I is posited as indivisible, whereas the I to which the non-I is opposed is posited as divisible. Hence, insofar as there is a non-I opposed to it, the I is itself in opposition to the absolute I. Accordingly, the third principle reads, in the absolute I, I oppose a divisible non-I to the divisible I. Summing up what we have so far, the first principle provides us with the I, the second with the non-I, and the third principle unites the two by asserting the divisibility of the I and the non-I. We thus have the basis of the whole of his science, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Up to this point, however, we are no step closer in showing how we come to be self-conscious. That is, from the derivation so far, we only have the third principle to work from. However, in this synthesis, there are also again new contradictions. Since limitation is also a determination, two main antitheses arise. The first, the I posits the non-I as determined by the I, that is, the I determines the non-I or it acts or is practical. And second, the I posits itself as determined by the non-I, that is, the I posits itself as affected, it perceives or is theoretical. It is at this point that Fichte divides his science in the theoretical and the practical part. The theoretical is concerned with how the I and non-I are distinguished from each other and how to reflect on the subject as object, that is, to abstract from all objects. The practical part is concerned with the synthesis of the infinite positing of the I and the posited finite limitation, the representation of the I. The science can only be completed if all contradictions are solved. Thus, the task forward is set. We have to synthesize the theoretical and the practical part in order to arrive at our goal. Or, the science must systematically seek out the contradictions which are contained in the I's original synthesis, and which are always already synthetically resolved in every actual consciousness, since otherwise the unity of consciousness would be impossible. Yet, in order to do this, we first need to derive the remaining categories. In the next video, the reconstruction of the theoretical and practical part is provided that shows how we come to be self-conscious. For now, we continue with the deconstruction of the science and derive the rest of the categories. We start with the theoretical statement just seen. The I posit itself as determined by the non-I. This statement gives rise to yet again a thesis 
and antithesis. The I is determined by the non-I, that is, it is passive, or the I posits itself as determined, or it determines itself, that is, it is active. Yet again, we have a contradiction. For how can the I be both active and passive? The synthesis of the two is again that they both hold partially. That is, the I is active to the extent that the non-I is not active, and passive to the extent that the non-I is active. In other words, the I limits the non-I just as the non-I limits the I. This is what Fichte calls reciprocal determination. The best example I can give you is that of a coin. The coin has a front and a back. Both exist at the same time. And the one is the negation of the other. The front and the back are the same, yet different. The front determines the back, and the back determines the front. They are reciprocally determined. It is the biblical heaven and earth, the alchemical above and below, the Chinese concept of yin and yang, and so on. Not the one without the other. The question remains, however, how is this accomplished in one consciousness? Therefore, let us look at B again, for B also contains further contradictions. Let's start with B1. For if the non-I is able to determine the I, then it must hold some reality and not mere negation. Thus we have the non-I has reality in itself, or the non-I is mere negation and has no reality. Again, for this to synthesize, both must partially hold. If the non-I has any reality at all, then, according to the reciprocal determination just derived, it can only gain it as a result of the reality in the I being negated and transferred from the I to the non-I. Now, this of course does not decrease what was originally posited in the I. The total sum of reality is conserved, though it is differently distributed. We can now see that the reality of the non-I is the result of the passivity of the I. Therefore, this synthesis based on the reciprocal determination is the category of causality, the second principle of Kant's categories. Again, to make this more understandable, let us look at our coin again. When we look at the front, the front is active and the back is passive. When we turn the coin, the back has become the front. This front is only the front insofar as the back of the coin is not visible. Both are there at all times, but the reality is determined by the causality of the two, the turning of the coin. We have now seen how the non-I can have reality, but we still have not seen how the I, which originally is nothing but activity, can be limited or determined. Thus, we find in B2 the following contradictions. Either the I determines itself, or is active in being determined, or the I determines itself and is passive in being determined. This can again only hold if both are partially true. And to resolve this, the absolute I posits itself as finite by practically transferring its activity to the non-I. That is, the I is both substance and accidents. To explain this, let us use an example of a tree. The tree creates leaves and flowers, then dies and becomes a tree again. Throughout this process, the tree hood is preserved, that is, the substance, even though the representations change, that is, the accidents. And so it is with the eye, or, according to Fichte, there is originally only one substance, the eye. Within this one substance, all possible accidents, and so all possible realities, are posited. We have now derived Kant's categories of quality and the categories of relation. And to sum up, that the I posits itself as determined by the non-I 
means that in self-consciousness the subjective activity is unified with the opposed objective activity. This unification is only possible on the basis of a reciprocal determination of the I and non-I. In turn, the reciprocal determination presupposes the causality of the non-I and the substantiality of the I. So, we now have in the absolute I a divisible I and divisible non-I. But how do I know where the one ends and the other begins? In other words, how do I know where the subject ends and the object begins? The real question is which member is the subject and which is the object. They are not the same but are related. Thus we need a ground for discerning the one from the other. If the I would only be infinite, the positing of the I would go on indefinitely without ever being conscious of its own activity. Thus, for us to be conscious of the I, the I must be limited and thrown back onto itself. We need a check, or as Fichte calls it, anstos, on the activity of the I. This check must be something that is related to the I itself and that cannot exist independent of the I. No activity of the I, no anstos. Yet, the check itself can also not be produced by the I itself and must be beyond itself in order to make it reflect on itself. The anstos, the primordial impulse, that sets in motion the gradual self-limitation and self-determination of the initially void subject is not merely a mechanistical external impulse. It also joins towards another subject who, in the abyss of its freedom, functions as the challenge compelling me to limit or specify my freedom. That is, to accomplish the passage from the abstract egotistic freedom to concrete freedom within the rational, ethical universe. Perhaps this intersubjective aufforderung is not merely the secondary specification of the anstos, but its exemplary original case. We now only know that we need a check that is related to the I, yet lies beyond its own activity. This principle of something related to the eye, yet not produced by the eye itself, we also know from Lacan as the objet petit a, the object cause of desire. It is the something in the object that we want, so it is related to us, yet we did not produce the want itself. Hence, is not the anstos precisely such an appearance without anything that appears? A nothing which appears as something. This is what brings the Fichtian anstos uncannily close to the Lacanian object petit a, the object cause of desire, which is also a positivation of a lack, a stand in for a void. In this way, a check, a limiting factor, creates a feeling of lack. We do not have it yet, or we are not it yet. This is precisely the border between the I and the non-I. At this point, we cannot yet fully understand what the anstos really means. This we can only see fully in the practical part of the science in the next video. But we can see the next question that arises. Namely, now that we have an I and non-I, how do we hold them in one consciousness? And how do we become self-conscious by this act? In other words, what independent activity do we need to hold everything together? Now we have two opposed terms, but only by reflecting on the two do we arrive at self-consciousness. So how do we do this? We ended with the efficacy of the non-I on the one hand and the self-limitation of the I on the other. 
we need something that reflects. We need an independent activity that joins the I and non-I without cancelling them out. This is what Fichte calls the imagination. The imagination is an activity of the eye that holds together those things that are opposed while at the same time maintaining their opposition. The eye has the capacity and power to encompass both the eye and the non-eye without reducing the one to the other. We thus have in the absolute eye a limited eye and a limited non-eye and the imagination oscillates between the two terms, between the I and the non-I, activity and passivity. It is this oscillation that creates reality. Or, in the words of Alan Watts, the positive and the negative together constitute existence. We have to use existence as a neutral word that doesn't have as an opposite non-existence. Existence already includes non-existence. You could say being and non-being constitute existence. Just as we know physically, sound is constituted by sound silence in very rapid alternation. We need both terms. We again see the reciprocal determination. It is the imagination which reflects. And it is this reflection that creates consciousness. And with this, we have all ingredients to reconstruct our self-consciousness. From the Taathandlung, the self-positing of the I, we derived the founding principles of Fichte's science. The divisible I and the divisible non-I. This divisibility resulted in the delineation going forward between a practical and a theoretical science. We have seen the derivation of Kant's categories. Reality, negation, limitation, reciprocal determination, causality and substance accidents. We were given the efficacy of the non-I and the self-limiting of the I. The original activity of the I experiences an anstos and the imagination mediates between the two. In this theoretical synthesis, we have shown how the opposed, the I and the not I, can be thought together. The imagination keeps both of them together. The imagination, that point where all the tensions and conflicts are unitarily held together, achieves that structural unity whereby the three foundational principles can be thought together without destroying the unity of consciousness. The theoretical synthesis attempted to eliminate the non-essential and the contradictory so that the final synthesis is truly a fact of consciousness. But this fact must be exhibited as an original fact of the human spirit. And with this we are done with the deconstruction and ready to begin the reconstruction of self-consciousness in the next video. For now, Thank you for watching this video. For some reason I find Fichte really hard to understand since there is significantly less literature on Fichte than any other idealist. So I hope that I was able to help you in your journey somehow. And for now I hope that something good happens to you today and to see you in the next video on the reconstruction of self-consciousness.